Dr. Robertson, maybe we can maybe we can start. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. All right. All right. Uh, so, Karina, let's. Uh, I'm going to. We are live soon. I think you're live now. We're live. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon from Chile. I hope you are all very, very good. And thank you very much for coming here to this new geotechnical seminar here at University of Chile, organized by the Geotechnical Engineering Group. In this opportunity, we have uh, an awesome guest uh, with a lot of field experience, with a lot of geotechnical experience. We are today sharing about geotechnical engineering with Professor Robertson. Hello, Dr. Robertson. How are you these days? How is everything in Canada? I'm very good, but I'm in California. Oh, you are in California. <laughs> oh, okay, right. yeah. I, I, yeah. I might be confused. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very no. much. I, no, I didn't I, know that. I spent many years in Canada, but I moved to California 17 years ago. Ah, okay. Long time. Yeah. I, I had no idea. So, yeah. so you are based uh, in, 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 Southern Cal in, in Southern California. Ah, nice. Very nice. Yeah. What city yeah. is that specifically? Uh, it's in Newport Beach, which is uh, south of Los Angeles. Ah, okay. Okay, okay, okay. But my understanding is that you are Canadian. Correct, yes. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. And um, ju just to start and, and know a little bit uh, more uh, about you, uh, how is it that Dr. Robertson became Dr. Robertson? Uh, where did you study? We 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 know that that for sure you are Canadian. <laughs> uh, how how has it been all your 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 academic professional experience to be to be today in the position that you are? Yeah. Well, if I go back to the beginning, I, I was born in in England, uh, so I, I grew up in southern England. Uh, in a family of which nobody had ever gone to advanced education. So nobody had ever gone to university in my family. Um, and um, I, I wasn't doing too well uh, at school, really, a pretty average student. Uh, but when I was about uh, 12, I got into competitive swimming. Uh, and I started to do very well at it. And that really helped me a lot. It, uh, the discipline of that sport uh, helped me become more disciplined at school. And I started to do a lot better at school. Uh, and and, and I, I did well in competitive swimming. I actually swam for Britain uh, in 1968. Um, and uh, so I, I started to do well at school. And so I did well enough that I could transfer to another school that would allow me to take the exams to go to university. And so in thinking about going to university, um, uh, at first I thought that uh, maybe I would like to be an airline pilot. And I spoke to pilots and many pilots said, that's a good idea if you get a degree uh, and an engineering degree is a good thing to do. And, and at school I was doing well in physics and math. And so that was logical to, to think about engineering. And they also said that if possible, go to one of the uh, British universities that, was, that had a university air squadron. This would be a, an air squadron of the Royal Air Force where you could uh, learn how to fly for free. And essentially you were sort of a volunteer uh, in the Air Force and they would teach you how to fly. And so I, I went to Nottingham University and I studied civil engineering and I chose civil engineering because it seemed like a very general area of engineering, uh, something I could relate to. Um, and I, I did join the air squadron and I did learn to fly, but I realized that I didn't overly enjoy flying. It was nice flying on a nice sunny day where I could look out the window down at the land, <laughs> but when it was not a sunny day, it didn't seem that much fun. <laughs> um, wow. and, and so what I, what I realized is I, I actually enjoyed looking down at the land forms. I like being up in a plane, but looking down at the ground and looking at the various land forms. And that was my first uh, inkling that I, I had an interest in geology and geomorphology about how, why, is the, why is the land shaped the way it is? Um, and what does that mean? And uh, 
so I got my undergrad in civil engineering. And like a lot of people, I got a job in London and I got a job with a big uh, British civil engineering company. At that time, it was called Sir William Halcro and Partners. And uh, now it's called Halcro. It's a big um, civil engineering company. And I was placed into their bridge section doing structural uh, engineering. And I, I hated structural engineering from the beginning. Uh, and that was because it was very codified and everything you did was according to the code. And it seemed to me that you know, one day a computer would be able to do that and it wouldn't really need um, an individual to do it since all you were doing were following the, was the code. Um, and on the floor that I was working at um, for a bridge design, there was a small group of people and I noticed that occasionally they kept leaving the office and they would be gone for days or weeks at a time. And I said to someone, well, what do those guys do? And they said, oh, those are the geotechs. And I said, well, okay. <laughs> I said, so what do they actually do? And so I went over and said, so tell me what you actually do. And they said, well, we, we do the geotechnical engineering. And so we do the site investigation and the foundation design for this bridge. And I said, well, tell me more about that. That sounds pretty interesting. And so they, they talked about site investigation and, and therefore having to go to the site and visit the site. And I thought, well, that sounds a lot more interesting. And so it was at about that time that I realized I wanted to leave England and uh, move to another country and of which Canada was my primary choice. And so I decided that I should go and get a master's degree because in geotechnical engineering, you really needed a little bit more than an undergrad because at undergrad, you typically only have maybe one or two courses in geotechnical engineering, you know, one on soil mechanics and one on foundations, uh, which is what I had. And so I thought I, I should get a master's degree. So I applied to schools in Canada and my first choice was to go to Vancouver. And fortunately, the University of British Columbia was the first school to reply and accept me to do a master's degree, which was perfect. So I went off to Vancouver and I did a, um, a research-based master's, uh, which meant I could get some funding, which was very helpful. Um, and after I got my master's, I worked for Golder Associates in Vancouver. And I worked for them for about three years and I worked in their tailings division. So their mine tailings. And I, I was uh, doing mine tailings work. And I found it very interesting, but after about three years, I wanted to do something different to sort of broaden my experience. And so I asked around in Golder about, could I move to a different um, division and do something different? And of course their response was, well, no, you're getting quite good at, at, at tailings. And so we'd prefer to keep you where you are. Um, and so quite by chance, a friend of mine who was also from England, who had worked for Arab in London, and he had a friend uh, and that friend had just taken a position in Hong Kong as the managing director of Fugro in Hong Kong, which at that time was a small consulting um, office for Fugro. Although Fugro was a an international company. The office in Hong Kong was a small consulting company, only with about five people. And he was looking for another engineer to help him in Hong Kong. So he had approached my friend, but my friend didn't want to leave Vancouver. And so he said, well, uh, I know this person, Peter Robertson, who, who is, um, is quite keen to do something different. He might be interested. And so uh, I had an interview with Fugro and I was off to Hong Kong. And so I went to Hong Kong for three years and I was actually the, the, the chief engineer because it was a small office and I was the only sort of expatriate engineer there. So I was the chief engineer and there were about four or five young um, Hong Kong Chinese engineers. But it was a time when lots was happening. And so projects were getting built very rapidly. This was typical of Hong Kong. And so the office started to expand. And so I spent three years there and the office expanded from five people to 55 people. So I was there at a time of rapid expansion. And so instead of working on one project at a time, I was now chief engineer, often supervising 10 projects at a time. And so my experience just escalated. 
you know, because over a three year period, I was getting lots of experience and a wide variety of experience from um, deep foundations, deep excavations, slope stability in residual soils, uh, rock excavations, uh, et cetera. So a very wide range of experience. So it was, it was a really exciting time. But at the end of that, uh, I realized that there was still a lot I didn't know and that uh, I realized that maybe I should go back and do a PhD because I still didn't really know everything that I was doing. Uh, you know, I had a master's degree, but I, I still didn't fully understand everything we were doing. And in going back to do a PhD, I wanted to do research uh, on in-situ testing because I had now worked for about six years and I realized that one of the biggest areas of uncertainty was site investigation. And of course, it's done for every project. Every project needs a site investigation. And I realized that the current methods seem to be very antiquated and um, ineffective. You know, typically going out with a, a drill rig, drilling a few boreholes, uh, doing some standard penetration tests, and taking a few samples. And it said that this, this does not seem to be very good. You know, the, this standard penetration test doesn't seem to be very good. It's, it's pretty crude. It's um, unreliable. And the samples we're getting are not very good quality. And therefore, the lab testing is questionable, et cetera. So I said, there's got to be a better way to do this. And so I uh, approached a number of universities around the world of who might be doing research on in situ testing. And as it happened, Professor Campanella, who had been my master's uh, thesis supervisor, and he was an expert on lab testing. So my master's thesis was on lab testing. Mm -hmm. And he replied and said, well, as it happens, I've realized that in-situ testing is going to be important. And he said, what I'm doing is I'm building a truck to basically take my lab into the field so that we can do in-situ testing in the field and the truck should be finished later this year. So it would be a perfect time for you to arrive and do your PhD on in-situ testing. So I went back to Vancouver and I did my PhD with Campanella. And uh, very quickly, as we started to research all of the different in-situ tests, very quickly I realized that, well, this cone penetration test, this really looks to be the most promising test. And of course, Fugro, uh, uh, was one of the leaders in CPT, but in Hong Kong, they were not doing any CPT. So I had no direct experience of CPT, but I was aware of it through Fugro and aware that they were using CPT offshore and in Holland. So I, I was aware of the test before starting my PhD. But for my PhD, I looked at the standard penetration test, the cone penetration test, the flat plate dilatometer, pressure meter testing, screw plate testing, field vein testing, you know, I, I looked at all of them and my, my thesis was on all of them. But really, I began to realize that the CPT was the one that I thought had the most potential in the future. And, and I think history shown that that's actually turned out to be correct. And so my presentation today is that, well, how far have we come in the last 50 years with the CPT? How much has it progressed since when I first started to get involved with it? Very, very, very interesting. Very, yeah. very, very interesting. Yeah. And, and so, uh, and after, uh, and after original, that, what, what happened? Well, originally I had planned to go back into industry, uh, but my life changed uh, somewhat. Uh, my, my wife uh, died from cancer and we had a, a young daughter. And so I realized that um, it wasn't really feasible for me to go back into industry. Uh, as a single parent with a two-year-old child. And so uh, Campanella said, well, why don't you stay at the university uh, and, you know, pursue an academic career? You know, you, we think you'd be very good at it. You, need, you should consider an academic career. And so at that time in my life, it said, well, yeah, I think this could be a good thing because with an academic career, I can control my life better than in private sector. You know, in the private sector, if the client needs you on site and there's a problem, you have to get on an airplane and go to site immediately. Exactly. But as an academic, you know, you go to conferences, but you know about the conference a year in advance. And so, you know, everything is planned out and you've got more control over your life and, and your, your time. And so uh, that was how I moved into academia. 
And so I, I, I picked up a sort of a five-year sort of postdoctoral position at UBC. And as that five years was coming to a close, uh, I was invited by Professor Yamalakowski in Italy that would I like to go and spend a year in Italy. So we, we went to Italy for a year. I had remarried uh, and we went to Italy for a year. We had a wonderful time uh, and I learned a lot working with Yamalakowski. And then I got a telephone call from Professor Morgenstern saying that a vacancy was coming up at the University of Alberta. Yeah. And was I interested in going there? And of course, uh, Professor Morgenstern is, is one of the most uh, outstanding mm -hmm. researchers and practitioners in the world. And he had a very strong group at the University of Alberta. So it, it, it seemed like an obvious thing to, to pursue that opportunity and move to Edmonton and uh, join the geotechnical group at the University of Alberta, which I did. And I, I was there for 17 years and I, I learned a great deal and, and, uh, and learned a great deal working with uh, Professor Morgenstern and others. There were lots of other good people at the university that I enjoyed working with. But after 17 years, I began to get that uh, urge to want to go back to the private sector mm. and leave academia and go back to the private sector. And by then, that two-year-old had now grown up uh, to be a young woman and, and gone to university. And uh, she had traveled and she had met an American and she was moving to California. So our, mm. our only daughter was moving to California. And um, so she got a job with Greg Drilling th through connections that I had. And um, so she got a, a job uh, with Greg Drilling. And very quickly, she contacted me and sort of said, you know, they would very much like it if you would come down. You know, you should think about moving down here. And so we realized that, well, she was going to get married. And if she had children, our grandchildren would be a thousand miles away. And so we thought, yeah, actually, a move to California would be a, a nice thing to do. And I would already was planning to leave the university. And so I, I joined Greg, which was an opportunity to sort of exit academia and go back into the private sector, but this time with a contractor. So Greg is a, a site investigation contractor. So I'd worked as a consultant, worked in academia, uh, and was now you know, involved with a contractor. And so I've, I've actually been uh, affiliated with Greg for now 17 years. Uh, but fortunately, Greg uh, allowed me that just as my academic position, I could continue to do private consulting. And so over the years, I, I've slowly um, increased my private consulting and decreased my activity directly with Greg. So now I act just as a, a technical advisor to Greg, and most of my time is actually in, in direct private consulting. And so in recent years, I've moved more into um, mine tailings <clears throat> because my original PhD was not just in-situ testing, but in-situ testing as it applied to soil liquefaction. So my work in industry had made me realize is that I didn't want to go back and do research like just to study in-situ testing. I wanted to study it for a particular application. And what I thought was the most challenging application was liquefaction, because at that time, most of the problems in clay soils could be handled quite well through high quality lab testing, because you can get high quality samples, do high quality lab testing, and you can get all the parameters you need for clay soils from samples. But for sand, that's very, very difficult. So sand uh, requires in situ testing you know, particularly penetration testing uh, because it's fast and, and, and cost effective uh, uh, because sand is very difficult to sample and very difficult to test. And the biggest design problem for sand is actually liquefaction. And so hence, I studied in-situ testing as it applies to liquefaction. And currently in the mine tailings industry, liquefaction is one of their biggest issues they're facing. You know, some Absolutely. of these... Some of these major tailings dam failures in recent years were all due to static or flow liquefaction. And uh, CPT had become you know, the primary in-situ tests for mine tailings. And so CPT for liquefaction in mine tailings is a big issue. And so in the last five years or so, I've probably spent a lot of my time in that area.
So you are you are a lot of time in the field, on the field. Uh, well, yes. I mean, I mean that the, the thing that attracted me at the beginning was the fact that you didn't stay in your office; you actually went out and visited the site. Uh, and so, yes, most of the projects I work on require a site visit, and so that is interesting. You get to travel to many different places in the world to go and visit these sites, particularly in the mining industry, because these mine sites can be uh, anywhere and they're, and they're mostly in relatively remote locations. Um, so you get to travel and, and visit some interesting places. Very nice, very, very nice. And uh, with all this experience and so many countries and academia, industry, Uh, is there a project in which you have a dear memory? I guess there are many dear memories. Uh, yeah. Is there any that you can mention? Or maybe now you have, even now you have a lot of projects and yeah. it's an exotic place or what, what has called the attention yeah. of, of some projects in your, in your experience? Yeah. Well, uh, the, the, good, the good thing is, of course, later in life now when I'm doing consulting, Uh, one of the privileges of doing it as a private consultant is you get to pick and choose a little bit. <laughs> so you, you tend to take on projects that are interesting and challenging. Um, and so most of them are interesting and challenging. Uh, one of the ones I'm working on right now is um, two tailings dams uh, for a mine that used to be an uh, open pit mine, but now has gone underground. And the underground is using block caving. And block caving means that you, you create a caving underground. And that caving generally reaches up and causes surface um, subsidence, so settlement of the ground. And the settlement of the ground is now encroaching underneath the tailings dams. And so these are not just regular tailings dams, these are regular tailings dams that are now going to experience significant settlement. Uh, and wow. the issue of uh, how do you mitigate the risks when there's going to be significant settlement under these structures? And when I say significant, I'm talking settlements that could exceed five meters. Wow. No, no, not not a, a few centimeters, but uh, you know, several meters of settlement. And, and the, the, the dam is how, what is the height of, the, of that dam? Uh, both of the dams are about 50 meters high. One of them is an old one that's 10%. essentially- 10%. Yeah. So one of them is an older one that's essentially closed and the stabilization measures are well advanced in dewatering. So that one's in pretty good shape. But the other one is a newer one and it's a partially lined facility and it's still in use. So it still has a, a pond and the tailings are, are young and they're saturated and it's got a, a, a pond on it. Um, and so that one's more challenging. You know, they're, they're removing the water from the pond, et cetera. And they're creating a stabilized uh, region, but it, it's quite challenging. And it's challenging because it's uh, unprecedented in the sense of we don't typically see this. And so, We don't, Absolutely. Have, yes. we don't have case histories Definitely. that we can go to and say, well, based on these previous ones, this is how they behaved. It says, no, there are no previous ones. Exactly, exactly. So It's the first time I hear such a, such a huge settlement for a dam. I mean, you don't hear those numbers every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's and interesting. The, and the, the other one, of course, was the, uh, when I was the chair of the expert panel for the... Uh, Tailings Dam failure in Brazil, the Brumadino mm, one. And, and right, that, was, that was interesting. Sad, of course, because it's such a catastrophic failure and so many people died. Um, but challenging in the sense of, uh, um, in a relatively short period, trying to do an investigation to determine exactly why did it fail. Uh, and, and, you know, we all could see that it failed due to static liquefaction because there was a video of it that, showed exactly what Shocking happened. Shocking video. Uh, the, the, the challenge is, that, well, what made it fail on that particular day? What was yeah. special about that day? Yeah, definitely that's a landmark in the, yeah. In yeah. the history of dam design yeah. for, for those facilities, right? Yeah, definitely. exactly. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, I, I think you, you have come many, many times to Chile also. Uh, yes, I yes I have. Well, actually, not too many times, but yeah, a number of times. Uh, 
and in fact, you know, in, in the middle of my presentation, I, I talk about, uh, you know, case histories of how useful they can be. And uh, I, I show a, a, an image and the image is actually from a, a mine site in Chile. Nice. And uh, just just to just a, a, a little a quick question, uh, a quick a quick question. Uh, what is the with so much geotech and so many interesting projects? Uh, I guess do you still practice uh, swimming? <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, I, I, not as much as I'd like, although um, Southern California is a perfect place for it because. Uh, every high school has a 50 meter swimming pool and it's outdoors. So there, there's lots of outdoor pools to swim in. Um, but the, the, the challenge is, is, you know, my life is fairly busy and it's actually quite difficult to find enough time. All right. Very nice. <laughs> but Very but nice. the nice thing is that we do live close to our daughter and uh, she did get married. She did have children. She has twin girls. Those girls are now 12. Uh, and so one of the, uh, the nicest things is to, to be close to them and, and to see the grandchildren grow up. Definitely, definitely. Thank you very much for sharing all that information and details about, uh, about your life and professional experience, uh, Dr. Robertson. I, I will let you share your presentation now. I will okay. turn, that, we'll turn off my microphone and camera so we can learn from you in this opportunity. Thank you very much again for, for being with, uh, with us, uh, Dr. Roberts. Thank you. You're welcome. Hopefully you can see my slides. Okay, I, I assume you can see my slides. So I'll turn off my video. You don't need to watch me during the presentation. Um, so the introduction about myself hopefully led up to uh, you know this topic. And, and I actually gave this talk at a, a recent conference in Italy in June at, at CPT 22. And uh, so it's sort of, a, it's a quick review and says, so how far has the, have we come uh, with the cone penetration test in the, in the last 50 years? Now I did my PhD 42 years ago. So uh, I sort of rounded it up to 50 because as part of my research, I, I did look uh, at where it had come from. Um, so, a little bit of a disclaimer to start with, because uh, I, I can't talk about everything. And so, first of all, I'm going to talk primarily about uh, onshore history, uh, because in the offshore industry, there's been tremendous use of the CPT. And uh, Tom Lun gave a very nice state of the art at the conference at, at CPT 10, which we had organized here in California. And so he gave a nice overview of CPT at that time in the offshore industry. So I'm only going to focus on onshore. And of course, I have a time limitation. Uh, so I don't have a lot of time to cover the 50 years. Uh, and so I'm only going to look at the highlights. And, and so in, in looking at highlights, I'm obviously going to exclude some things due to time constraints and obviously show any limited examples. And of course, uh, it'll all be based on, on my, my opinion of things. And so there's a, a slight selective biased uh, uh, of my opinion, hopefully not too much biased. So let's look at the history of the CPT. So it first started back in the 1930s as a mechanical device. And here's a very famous old photograph from the 1930s of this very simple mechanical device that was being pushed into the ground and the, the load on the tip was being measured with a hydraulic load cell. So the person here at the bottom is reading the gauges of the load on the tip uh, from these hydraulic um, load cell. And then in the 1960s, actually Fugro uh, took the lead and Fugro developed probably the first commercial electric cone. And this is roughly what it looked like. So it has the same dimensions as the early mechanical one. It, was, it had a cross-sectional area of 10 square centimeters. So that's about 36 millimeters in diameter. And it had a sleeve behind it that you could measure the friction on the side as well as the uh, tip stress. So you could measure the, the load on the tip, uh, which when divided by the area would give you the tip stress. And then you could measure the load of the soil passing the, the sleeve. And when that was divided by the surface area, you could get the sleeve friction in units of stress. So the early cone, it was electric, it was strain gauges, and it would measure the tip and sleeve uh, in units of stress. 
And then in the 70s, that's when the CPT really started to take off because offshore work, both in the North Sea and in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, was getting very busy. And it very quickly became apparent that the CPT was the primary way to investigate soils offshore. And then, of course, by the time we got into the 2000s, uh, it's now all digital data with it advanced software, which we'll um, talk about briefly. So there's lots of publications about the CPT. So if you go way back to the 70s, there was the European Symposium on Penetration Testing. The very first one was in 1974. And then there was another one in 1984. And then in 1988, uh, Professor Smertman held the first international symposium on, on penetration testing, and that was in Florida. And then in the 1990s, the first symposium on the comb penetration test was organized in Sweden, and that was CPT 95. And then uh, I was the chair of the International Committee for ISM, ISM and G. And uh, so we organized the first international site characterization conference, and that was held in Atlanta in 1998. And then we had a second one in 2004 in uh, Porto in Portugal, and then the third one in Taiwan in 08. And then um, we decided to restart the CPT symposium. And so I organized CPT 10 here in Huntington Beach in California in, in 2010. And because it had been quite some time since the last one, we actually had a series of regional reports that would describe um, how the CPT was being used in various regions around the world to get an idea of what the current practice was back in, in 2010. And then there was an ISC4 uh, in 2012, um, and that was in, um, I've forgotten where it was now actually, and then CPT14 was in Vegas, and then ISC5 was in 2016. And then CPT18 was in uh, Holland, in Delft. And then in the 20s, there's ISC6, uh, which was in Budapest. And then CPT22, which was just this June uh, in Italy and Bologna. And that was where I actually gave this, this, this presentation. Um, and in uh, 2026, CPT26 is uh, going to Vancouver and I'll be involved in the organization of that. And so if any of you are interested in attending it, then it's a great city to be, and it'll be in the summer of 2026 in four years time. So when you look at the regional growth of the use of the CPD, so in the 70s, it was being used in, in Holland, the Netherlands, and in, in Belgium, uh, you know, which was where the mechanical CPT had been used as well. So the electric CPT was being used extensively and also offshore North, North Sea. And then in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, out of mostly Houston. And then by the time the 1980s and 1990s came around, it was, of course, in much bigger use in Europe and also beginning to see significant use in North America and Canada and even into Mexico. And there was a, a researcher in South Africa and Australia was beginning to use it, beginning to be used in Southeast Asia and in parts of the Middle East as, uh, as well. And then by the time we get into where we are now, of course, it's pretty well worldwide. The one exception you can see is here in Russia. And uh, Russia has their own standard, uh, which is referred to as this GOST uh, standard. And so they do their own form of CPT based on a Russian standard, which is a little bit different than the international standard. So their cones aren't quite the same as the international ones. So their data is just a little bit different. So they're a little bit uh, of an exception internationally. And China, uh, uh, historically had its own standard as well, but China is beginning to embrace the international standards and so is beginning to, to do CPT more along international standards. So over the years, there's been quite an evolution of the cones themselves. You know, back when I did my PhD in 1980, the cones were mostly analog. So that means the, um, the electrical signal from the strain gauges uh, would come up the cable and then go to a chart recorder. And so you would see the data on the chart recorder 
And then so processing the data was very time consuming. You had to basically then digitize the chart recording by hand, which was very time consuming. But very quickly, um, various analog to digital converters came along. And so the cones were analog and then the signal was converted to a digital signal and then went to a, um, uh, a personal computer at the ground surface. And of course, in those early days, those personal computers were pretty big and bulky uh, and, and they didn't have much memory. And so you still had the chart recorder to have a sort of a physical record of the data because the memory on the computer were, was so small. But then uh, and nowadays, um, nearly all cones are digital, which means the A to D converter is down in the cone so that the data coming up the cable is now in digital form, which makes it much more reliable and stable. And so that's now the most common form of cones. And of course, in the early days, all cones had a cable that was pre-threaded through the rods, the pushing rods, and that cable would transmit the signal up to the, uh, the, the surface data acquisition system. But nowadays there are a number of different wireless systems, but the cable still tends to be the most popular. Although it seems like it would be cumbersome, it's actually not that cumbersome to use. It's pre-threaded through all the rods, uh, so it's, it's not that difficult to, to handle. And um, the cable means that you have you know, real-time data and it can handle large volumes of data, particularly you'll see later when there are uh, additional modules added to the cone. So it's not just the basic cone, you've now got other modules with additional data so that there can be lots of data coming up and it's much easier to do that in a cable. And if it's digital, you don't need many wires. It can be transmitted up a relatively small number of wires once it's in digital format. The cones themselves, as I said, the, uh, the, the early mechanical cone was, had a cross-sectional area of 10 square centimeters. So that was the, the original one. And you see that it pictured here on the right. Uh, nowadays, 15 square centimeters are quite common, and most standards accept either a 10 or a 15 square centimeter. Um, so the, the 15 is about 36 millimeters in diameter, and the 15 square centimeter is 44 millimeters in diameter. But there are some really big ones now. There you can get up to 40 square centimeters for pushing to gravel. They're not that common, but they do have lots of potential in areas that have lots of gravel deposits. And then these mini cones, either two square centimeters or five square centimeters is becoming popular, particularly the five square centimeter, particularly for shallow investigations. And the little miniature ones, either one square centimeter or two square centimeters have become popular for uh, research uh, laboratory studies. And then back in the 1980s, when I was at UBC, one of the things we, uh, we identified was uh, that when cones were lowered in water, as they were offshore, um, the tip resistance you would expect should measure the water pressure. But it was always measuring less than that. And we realized that the reason it was measuring less is because the water pressure would act on the shoulder behind the tip, because the water seals, the O-rings that would keep the water out of the cone, were behind the cone. And so there was this little shoulder where the water pressure could act on so that the net area of the cone for the water pressure was not the same as the gross area. So that led to this correction that said, well, we're measuring this QC, which is the load on the tip divided by the total cross-sectional area of the tip. But when you're below the water level, uh, you've got this water pressure acting on the shoulder and this A is the net area ratio, which is typically about 80%. So it's one minus that. So it's typically about 0.2. So you have to make uh, a correction that's 20% of the water pressure. Now this correction is, is very, very small in sands because in sands, the tip resistance is very large and there's very little excess water pressure. And so you've just got say hydrostatic water pressure, which is not that big relative to the tip. And so the correction is very minor uh, in sands, but it can be uh, up to 10, maybe even as high as 15% in extremely soft clays. So in the early eighties, this became recognized. It's now required in all standards uh, that you need to make that correction. And a similar correction is required on the, on the sleeve because in the old days, the sleeves would have uh, different end areas, so they would have a differential 
uh, force on the sleeve. And so when you lowered the cones in water, you would expect that the sleeve should measure zero because the, the water cannot uh, sustain any shear stresses. Uh, but the early cones would in fact record uh, a, a sleeve friction and some cones, it was positive and other designs, it could be negative. Uh, and of course that was because of this unequal area effect. And so after the 1980s, it also became standardized that uh, most standards require that cones must have equal end area friction sleeves to minimize this uh, net area effect on the sleeve friction. So those have all become standardized and they're, they're in the codes. Over the years, the cones have had different designs. Um, there was a period of time in the 80s and 90s where uh, in Europe, it was very popular to build fairly robust cones that were referred to as subtraction cones. And so you basically had a single load cell and the bottom of the load cell would measure the force on the tip. And then the top of the load cell would measure the force on the tip plus the sleeve. And so to calculate the sleeve resistance, you'd have to subtract the two loads. And so that hence they were referred to as subtraction load cells. But uh, it's been shown that to get improved accuracy, particularly on the sleeve resistance, then you're better to have two separate load cells uh, and have each of them being recorded separately with their own individual zero load baselines. And uh, you get much more accurate sleeve frictions that way. And then also, um, as we've, uh, particularly in the offshore industry, as cones have been taken off into deep water and they're testing extremely soft um, soils right at the mud line offshore. And they started to realize that the O-rings uh, that were keeping the water out uh, created a small internal friction. And so when you looked at the calibration of the sleeve resistance, there was a small offset at very small uh, sleeve resistances. So if the sleeve resistance was maybe two or three kPa, then it would require that amount of resistance before the O-rings would start to, uh, you'd overcome the friction of the O-rings and start to record this, the, the correct sleeve resistance. And so modifications to cones have been developed. You know, one of them is a, a little spring that can be added. And so that improves the reliability and it removes that offset and you have much uh, improved accuracy of, of the sleeve at extremely small um, sleeve resistance values. And of course, there's been improved accuracy. You know, here's the typical calibration of a strain gauge low cell. So you've got nonlinearity and hysteresis, all of which are very small for uh, well-designed load, load cell, strain gauge load cells. But um, what experience has shown is that uh, the zero load is very important. So when you start off, uh, you, you hold the cone uh, above the ground surface and you take the zero load reading as your reference for the test. So everything is gonna be referenced to that initial reading in the air above the ground when the cone is in the vertical position. And when you finish the sounding, when you pull the cone out, you take another zero load reading. And of course, ideally it should come back to exactly the same reading, but usually there's a slight drift in that zero load reading for a number of reasons. And so monitoring that zero load drift is very important, particularly in soft soils. And that's now required in all standards that you must monitor the zero load reading both at the start and the end of every sounding and track that with time. And when it comes to uh, checking the calibration of the cone, as long as that zero load reading it is essentially the same as what it was at the time of the calibration, it hasn't changed, then the low cell is in good condition and doesn't really need recalibration. But if the load cell, if the zero load reading should change, then that's a good time to have the cone recalibrated just to check that it hasn't been damaged. And, uh, and there was a good paper in CPT 14 by uh, Yuk Puchin uh, from Fugro. And he wrote a, a really excellent uh, keynote uh, paper about uh, accuracy of cones and all of the elements that come into it and, and how you can ensure that the cone data is, is of the highest quality that it can be.
So cones come in, in many different capacities. So that's often referred to as the full scale output. And so often the tip resistance is the primary one. And most commercial cones are relatively high capacity cones. And they're typically in the order of 80 to 100 megapascals capacity. Um, but you can get cones, uh, low capacity cones, all the way down to three megapascals. So uh, a very sensitive cone. And so obviously these are designed for very, very soft soils, whereas the high capacity cones are designed for very stiff and very strong soils. So they come in a wide range of uh, capacities now. And it's important to, um, to choose the uh, correct capacity relevant to the work you're, you're doing. So if you're investigating very soft soils, it would be better to have a lower capacity cone because you would have improved accuracy. Because the accuracy is usually quoted as a percentage of the full scale output. And usually you can expect a, an accuracy and repeatability in the order of 0.1% of full scale output. And so obviously if the full scale output is a little bit lower, you've got higher accuracy. And over the years, many sensors have been added to the cone. Uh, you know, originally it was just the tip and sleeve resistance. And then uh, very quickly, very simple inclinometers were put into cones so that you could track that the cone was staying essentially vertical while you were pushing it. And then in the 1970s, pore pressure uh, elements were added so you could measure the, the pore pressure. And then temperature was added. And then in the 1980s, geophones were added so you could measure seismic, either shear wave velocity or nowadays including P wave velocity. And then of course, electrical conductivity and resistivity was added. And then uh, also dielectric, which is slightly different than, than resistivity. And then of course, passive gamma. And then in some places actually active gamma was added, although that's pretty rare nowadays. Also cameras were installed. So you had a, a vision cone, so you could actually have a look at the soil while you were pushing. These haven't really caught on because uh, if you do eight hours of CPT, watching eight hours of video of soil passing the window of the cone can be pretty mind uh, numbing and boring. Uh, so vision cones have only found sort of uh, specialized applications. There have be also been acoustic cones. Uh, and then in Europe, uh, they've got magnetometers to look for um, unexploded bombs. And then of course, there have been a variety of vapor uh, samplers, including vapor samplers, which is often referred to as the membrane interface probe, the MIP probe. And then there's a hydraulic profiling probe where you inject water out of the side of the probe and you measure the pressure uh, to inject uh, water out at a constant flow rate. This is very useful in unsaturated soils. And then there, of course, are, are water samplers. And then in recent years, there's the potential of adding nuclear magnetic resonance to actually measure water content of soils. This, this is in its early stages. It's not yet been adapted onto the CPT, but we're likely to see it get moved onto the CPT at some time in the near future. So many of these have evolved from borehole geophysics. But the most popular sensors, as I said, the early cones measured tip and sleeve. And then in the 70s, they added pore pressure. In the early days, the pore pressure was on the face of the cone, but then they rapidly realized that it was probably easier to put it on the shoulder. And that was actually where you wanted to uh, measure the water pressure to make the correction uh, for unequal end area. So now the U2 is the most common location, particularly to make that small correction. And then in the 1980s, geophones were added to measure shear wave velocity. And so the most common cones are these 10 and 15 square centimeter cones with pore pressure uh, measurements. And so now CPT is, is almost always CPT with pore pressure measurements. So it often has the acronym CPTU, uh, but in many cases, the pore pressure is automatically included. And so it's almost regularly treated as a regular CPT. But uh, when geophones were added, this introduced the seismic CPT. And so we actually did this when we were at UBC in, in about 1983. And this really has uh, grown to become um, uh, very popular and has lots of potential because it can have up to seven measurements in one you know, cost-effective continuous sounding. So you've got the tip resistance, the sleeve resistance, the, the pore pressure while you're pushing, sometimes referred to as the dynamic pore pressure. 
And then you've got the shear wave velocity, sometimes the P wave velocity. And then uh, if you're pushing through soils uh, that generate excess pore pressures, if you stop and allow those pore pressures to dissipate, then you get a dissipation curve. And the rate at which that pore pressure dissipates is a function of the coefficient of consolidation. And so uh, a very popular number is to calculate the time it takes to dissipate 50% of the excess pore pressure. So that's referred to as T50. So you can measure T50, and then of course, eventually you get to equilibrium and you get the U0, and of course you've got inclination. So you've got up to seven measurements in one single uh, test. So when you think that real soil behavior is quite complicated and that most constitutive models require anywhere from 10 to 15 parameters to describe the behavior of soil, and that's reasonably well-behaved soil. So you typically need in the order of 10 to 15 parameters to describe the behavior of real soil. And so if you want to try and estimate the real behavior of soils, then you're going to need more than one measurement. Uh, and ideally, you want more than two or three. You want as many as you can. And so seismic CPT, you get up to seven measurements, which means you get closer to actually understanding what the real behavior of the soil is uh, that you need for ultimately for your design. So the seismic CPT uh, has uh, the most potential, its use is growing rapidly, and I think you'll see it, it used a lot more around the world. Now, as I said, there are numerous standards. There's an international standard and the international standard of 2012 actually had these application classes, but the updated international standard is going to move away from these application classes because they were to so difficult to actually implement. And they're moving towards a standard that actually looks a lot more like the ASTM standard, which is a more procedural standard, actually telling you this is how you need to do the test to get the highest quality data. And if you want to see various standards, if you look at the regional report in CPT-10, it'll tell you. And all of these conferences, all of these CPT conferences I've talked about, all of the papers are available free online. Um, and I gave you the, one of the web links to, to go to. So that was one of the things when we organized CPT-10, we wanted the papers to be freely available uh, online to anybody. So when it comes to pushing equipment, it varies enormously from small little 10 uh, kilonewton uh, pieces of equipment all the way up to 200 kilonewtons and even up to 250 kilonewtons. So small pieces of equipment that come in different sizes and colors, et cetera. So uh, these smaller pieces of equipment are now becoming very popular. And they're becoming popular because they're relatively low cost to purchase, which means you can get into doing CPT fairly effectively. Uh, but obviously, if, if they're relatively small, they don't weigh a lot. And if you want to push with 200 kilonewtons, these small pieces of equipment don't weigh 200 kilonewtons. And so most of them have anchoring systems. So you can see it in the diagrams here. You can see these little units have anchors to the side. And so these units all have to be anchored and they all, they all have self anchors. This one in the bottom right hand corner, you can see the little uh, motor at the top and it, it, it installs the anchor itself. And then once it's anchored, it's locked down. And so although the unit itself may only weigh um, uh, a few tons, which is what, uh, less than 10 kilonewtons, um, you can, no, actually 20 kilonewtons, um, you can actually push with 200 kilonewtons once it's anchored down. But they're, they're a little slow to operate because you obviously have to anchor down. So uh, in, in some parts of the world, particularly in big urban areas, um, you see these trucks. And so the picture on the left here is, is, is one typical for Greg here in California. So Greg has offices in Northern and Southern California. So they're urban areas. And so these big trucks are much more efficient. They, they, they weigh 25 tons, so they're 250 kilonewtons in weight, and they push from the center of gravity. And so they, and they've got cameras underneath. So they're very efficient. You drive directly over the location and you can start pushing uh, and they're, they're very effective. And in fact, uh, um, one of your local companies in Santiago, LMMG, the G is, uh, stands for Greg. So they are sort of partnered with Greg. And, and so they actually have one of the Greg trucks. So a truck very much like this is, is in 
uh, Santiago and uh, does CPT down in, in Chile. And of course, there are track mounted units. And of course, the Europeans quite like these combination truck and track. So it, it's got the two in one combination. They're becoming quite popular. And then there's uh, various drill rigs designed to push with CPT um, so that you can push the CPT. And then after you push the CPT, you can then drill and take samples. And there's a wide range of equipment that does that. But one of the most interesting ones is, in fact, sonic drilling. Sonic drilling is becoming very popular in the world, partly because of its speed of operation. And you get a continuous core of the soil that you can actually look at. So for visual classification, you, you bring up this continuous core. Of course, the, 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 the core is relatively deserved due to the sonic vibrations, but it, it, it's very good for visual observation. And so some of the manufacturers of, of the sonic equipment, so Eigelkamp in, in Holland, um, they've developed a, a little static pushing unit that is clamped into the, the clamps at the back of the sonic rig. So you can stand there and do traditional static uh, CPT at the back of one of their rigs. And then once you finish that, you can then drill and take continuous core. So this is becoming quite popular, having that combination of a continuous push with the CPT and then having continuous core essentially right next to it. And because it's sonic, they've also uh, simplified the cone design so that you can actually push the cone in directly with the drill rig. And the nice thing about this is if you encounter a hard layer, like a gravel layer or a very stiff cemented layer that's hard to get through, you can turn on the vibrations and vibrate the cone through. And once you're through the hard layer, you can turn the vibrator off and go back to doing um, static um, CPT according to the standards. So this has lots of potential in the future. And then um, in the offshore industry, they've been used to doing wireline CPT in deep offshore. You know, if you're in a thousand meters of water, then typically you're doing CPT in a borehole and you're using wire lines to lower the CPT down into the borehole. So this equipment is now moving onshore. The picture on the right shows the Fugro system for doing wireline CPT onshore. And there are a variety of different systems, some of them a little bit smaller and easier to use than this one, because this one has a hydraulic piston that's lowered down and clamps in the bottom of the drill casing and then pushes the cone one or one and a half meters out the bottom of the borehole. <clears throat> and then in Italy, someone had developed a system where you basically had a spring-loaded memory cone and it, was, uh, it could stick out from the bottom of the drill bit. So in softer soils, it would stick out in front of the drill bit. And then if it was very hard soils, it would get sort of pushed back against its spring, against the, the drill bit. So you could do continuous CPT while drilling. Now, the advantage of wireline operations is that means you can actually do CPT to much greater depths. Typically, you max out at about 100 meters when you're pushing from the surface. But if you do wireline CPT, you can actually go much deeper. And one of the biggest criticisms of the CPT is often people say, well, it's a great test, but I don't get to see a sample. And that's true. You don't get to see a sample while you're doing the CPT. But um, if you stop and move over, um, you can either do sonic, which I just described if you're pushing the CPT with a sonic drill. But if you're pushing it with one of these um, specialized pushing equipments, either a truck or one of these small uh, trailer units, um, then there are a number of these little push-in samplers where you can push in the sampler to get a sample. So uh, in Holland, the uh, earliest version was referred to as this Mostap sampler, which is a push-in sampler. It actually has a little um, sock inside that contains uh, the sample. Uh, and so you can get a small disturbed sample of the soil uh, for classification purposes. And then here in California, we use this sort of simple piston sampler where you push it to the required depth, you pull back to expose the sampler and then push the sampler to get the sample and pull the whole thing out. Now this sounds like a slow procedure, but um, if you've just done the CPT, uh, you, you, you don't have to do continuous sampling. You only want to sample the layers that are of most interest to you for the project. And uh, so you can, you can just take a small number of selected samples at selected depths based on the CPT profile. And when you're pushing the sampler, you don't have to push it at the standard rate of only two centimeters a second. 
you can push it as fast as the hydraulics will go. And for, for these big trucks that Greg uses, that means you can actually push it uh, about 20 times faster. So you end up pushing these samplers in really quickly to get these samples and you can extract them quickly. And in Australia, when they were doing work in very soft tailings, they de de designed a thin walled um, 60 millimeter diameter um, undisturbed sampler. So you pushed it in closed ended and then would then push it uh, like a piston sampler to take a sample. Now, because it's pushed closed ended, you have a small zone of disturbance in front of it. So they designed the sampler to be a, a meter long so that you would push beyond the zone of disturbance. And so the bottom of the sample would be an undisturbed material. And they had a rather unique way of cutting the sample off and bringing it back. So there's a variety of, uh, of these direct push samplers that you can push in using CPT equipment. And of course, um, there's been growth in continuous CPT and automation because in the early days, uh, most of the pushing was uh, semi-continuous that you were pushing uh, the cone in typically with standard one meter long push rods. So you would push the cone for a meter and then you would stop while you added another rod and then you would push it an additional meter. And various hydraulic systems, the rod could be added quite quickly, but there was a short pause in the penetration. So it wasn't truly a continuous push. There were short pauses. Now, if you're doing seismic, and you're doing dissipation tests, those pauses are ideal to measure the shear wave velocity and to do a dissipation test. But in some conditions, it's nice to actually do truly continuous pushing with no pauses, particularly in material like silts, where you might be worried about um, uh, the pauses uh, enhancing drainage. And therefore, when you do start pushing, you're unable to actually reach fully undrained conditions. And you would like to interpret the silt in an undrained condition. So there are a variety of devices to get continuous pushes. In, in Holland, Vandenberg have developed this single twist system. So they have a wheel of these short segments of rods and these short segments of rods come over and with a, an automated single twist, they're attached to the previous rod and the push is continuous. So there's no pauses, it's got a double hydraulic system and it's fully automated. Uh, nobody actually touches the rods uh, and so you get a continuous automated push. And then uh, there are also systems that use coiled tubing and Greg has a, a coiled tubing system. Um, and then of course, um, because of some of these failures in Brazil and the need to get onto sites where you may not want to put people out onto the site. And so there's now a number of automated continuous systems. So Greg has a small little system uh, that's designed to be fully automated and uses coiled tubing. Fugo has a, has a bigger unit, also uses coiled tubing. And for scale, you can see the person here. So you can see that the Fugro one is about uh, three times the size of, of the Greg one. So the Greg one is ideal for sort of small locations. The Fugro is, is, is better suited for deeper penetrations, uh, say for big tailings, dams, et cetera. So continuous and automated. When it comes to interpretation, um, uh, in the early days, there was a lot of experimental work, you know, where people would have uh, 1G samples, like the picture on the left, where you'd have a sample and a glass face, and you could push the cone in and you could look at the, uh, the, the, the penetration mechanism. So in the early days, there was lots of work on that. There were 1G samples, shallow penetration, mostly ideal soils, mostly single layer soils, although you can see the picture on the left is is multiple layers and it shows you that how the layers do get uh, pushed down and smeared due to the penetration process. And then there was lots of lab testing in the uh, 80s and 90s. There was a lot of large calibration chamber work. So these were pushing full size cones into large samples, maybe a meter in diameter. Again, 1G samples. Again, mostly ideal soils in the early days, mostly clean silica sands. And then over the years, there's been some work on carbonate sands, a little bit of work on silty sands, and now a little bit of work on cemented sands. And then of course, people realize that, well, if we made the cone smaller, we could make the sample smaller. And so people realize if they made these little tiny miniature cones, 
you could push them into smaller samples. And in fact, you could push them into essentially a relatively large triaxial sample. And so in the early days, the samples were made of, of clay, ideal clay, so that you could do, because making a clay sample on these giant one meter diameter um, calibration chambers was unrealistic. It would take months or even years to consolidate the sample, whereas these smaller samples would consolidate much faster. But you have to use a much, much smaller cone. And uh, improvements in, in microelectronics and micromachining means that you could have these little tiny cones that could do it. And of course, the growth of centrifuges uh, also um, uh, meant a growth in developing little mini cones that you could push into centrifuge, which was greater than 1G. And again, most of the early work was clean sands. There's been some work on cemented sands and ideal soft clays. Uh, but there's been a lot of work on experimental sites. So uh, in the early days when I was at UBC, um, we had our own research sites. Um, so the research site at UBC, the first one we had was McDonald's Farm, uh, which was in the Fraser River Delta. Now over the years, a number of universities have research sites. There's a number of national research sites. Um, here in North America, there's a number. Europe's got a number of national research sites. And of course, there's a, a growing number of project test sites. So the picture on the left is actually from a mine uh, in uh, Chile. And it's a mine where they're looking to, it, it, the, the tailings uh, facility is going into closure. So they're no longer placing tailings in. They've taken the water off. It's actually remarkably free draining and they're planning to put some rock fill on top to increase the storage of waste rock. And so they built a couple of test pads. Uh, these are very large test pads, over 30 meters high, and the tailings is over 100 meters deep. And so they did boreholes and CPTs, and they did shear wave velocities, et cetera. So lots of information, lots of lab testing. So the nice thing about these experimental sites is these deal with natural soils. So these are real soils, not the ideal soils that tend to be created in the lab. So they are sands, clays, silts, calcareous, residual soils, et cetera. In this case, it was tailings. And of course, some of these sites have variable stress histories. They have natural site variability. They're not perfectly um, homogeneous. And uh, most of them are generally shallow. Uh, this one's a bit of an exception where it goes all the way down to 100 meters, but a lot of the research sites are often less than 30 meters. And of course, they often do lots of other in-situ tests and they often do lots of supporting uh, lab testing. And a number of the sites like this one uh, have performance data where they were able to build uh, a large uh, embankment and actually monitor it to see how much it settled, how much shear deformation occurred, how much densification, et cetera. And so lots of performance uh, data. So these experimental sites are becoming much more popular. In the interpretation in terms of theory, uh, in the numerical work, in the early days, there were lots of closed form solutions, bearing capacity solutions like the one illustrated on the left, and then upper and lower bound solutions, particularly for clays. And then cavity expansion became quite popular. And so using things like spherical cavity expansion to model the penetration resistance, this has become very popular. Uh, it's, a, it's a very simple thing to do. And in fact, now you can run cavity expansion with sort of realistic uh, constitutive models. The, a lot of the early work was done on ideal soils, again, clean sands and ideal clays, but increasingly uh, branching into sort of more natural complex soils. Um, a lot of uh, numerical deformation analysis are so moving away from sort of closed form solutions to now running finite element um, analysis uh, using complex constitutive models, as well as uh, uh, discrete element modeling. So the one on the left is discrete element, one on the right is finite element. Uh, and there are continued advancements. Now there's some work being done with uh, uh, multi-point method, MPM. But again, mostly ideal soils, mostly clean sands and ideal clays, but some work done on cemented sand. So it's beginning to branch out into the more complex soils. Now interpretation in general, uh, it, it's progression from originally very empirical to more theoretical. Mostly it's still semi-empirical, and that's because it's based on real uh, site performance from real soils, where the theory is not always able to model the real soil behavior. But the theory 
creates the framework of which the, the interpretation should be done. So most of the semi-empirical methods are based on a framework that comes from theory because real souls are often more complex than that can be covered by the theory. And increasingly the recognition of the role of microstructure, you know, such as aging and bonding and becoming recognized as more important. So here on the right is an example from, from quite a long time ago from Tay and Holsby. This is for the undrained shear strength of clays and the, and the theory said it was a function of rigidity index and uh, horizontal stress, as well as the roughness of the cone. And we knew from the field that, the, that it generally fell within that range. But more importantly, the recognition that there was this cone factor and theoretically that cone factor depended on these variables but in practice, people choose a value uh, based on, on the actual field experience. So over the years, there's, there's lots of uh, growth and in interpretation. You know, the most popular of course is soil profile, but you can get the, the state of the soil, relative density or uh, overconsolidation, consolidation uh, the, the strength and stiffness, the uh, stress history and compressibility and consolidation and permeability if you do dissipation tests. So lots of interpretation available now and uh, lots of case histories to balance it off. But uh, in uh, Professor Roth's ranking lecture in 1984, he was the one that said, if you're going to do interpretation, we really should be using normalized parameters. So not just using the tip resistance, but looking at the tip resistance that's normalized by the effective overburden stress. And he suggested the vertical effective stress because most of the time we don't know what the, the horizontal effective stress is. So we don't know what the mean effective stress is. So we use the vertical effective stress. And then I sort of suggested that uh, that should be modified a little bit based on soil type. So it looks a little bit more complicated, but if the stress exponent is one, it goes back to the original uh, method by Roth. And in SANS, the stress exponent is less than one. And so this slightly more complex uh, approach is taken. It's an iterative method, but most software programs do it automatically and it's not very difficult. And as I said earlier, the most common uh, interpretation is first of all, to identify what, what soil am I pushing through? So way back in, in the 1960s, Begerman had developed a simple method based on the mechanical cone where he recognized it was a function of the tip and the sleeve. And really it was the ratio of the two, which is often referred to as the friction ratio, which is the sleeve resistance divided by the tip resistance in percent. So it's basically the slope of these lines. And nowadays uh, we don't call it soil classification. We really call it a soil behavior type because classification systems that are traditionally used are based on physical characteristics, based on grain size and Atterberg limits, where the CPT doesn't respond directly to grain size and Atterberg limits. It's responding to the strength, stiffness, and compressibility of the soil, uh, which are indirectly linked to uh, grain size and Atterberg limits, but it's, it's really responding to the behavior. And so we called the classification charts soil behavior types. So it's telling you how the soil is behaving in situ as compared to the classification about how um, the material when remolded would be classified. And so over the years, these, these, uh, these soil behavior type charts have become very popular. And then in the uh, mid nineties, Jeffries and Davies recognized that the, the popular chart that I had developed in 1990, uh, which was on a log log scale, the boundaries between the various soil types were roughly concentric circles. And so they said, well, why don't we use this, this soil behavior type index, which is the radius of these concentric circles. So up in the top left-hand corner, the radius of this hypothetical circle would be one. And in the bottom right-hand corner, the radius was four. And so it was a very clever system of combining the two normalized parameters to come up with an index of soil type. And that's now become very popular because we know that many correlations change with soil type. And so by using this soil behavior type index, you can automatically adjust the correlation as a function of soil type as the soil type varies. And so this has now become very popular in most correlations. And uh, as a reference, I've shown 
that in, in this simple normalization, the red lines represent the normalized sleeve resistance. And I put them on there as a reference because they, they bracket where the data tends to fall. So this lower value of the, the sleeve resistance divided by the vertical stress equal to 0.01. So at 100 kPa, that line would be a 1 kPa sleeve friction, a very small number. So basically that, that lower left red line represents the lower limit of the accuracy of the cone. And then this upper one pretty well represents the upper limit of the capacity of the cone. So most of the data tends to fall between these two lines, you know, very, very stiff, soft rocks plot way up in the top right-hand corner, really hard to, to push into, and way down in the bottom left-hand corner would be super soft, sensitive clays where the remolded unrained strength is, is less than one kPa, you know, almost liquid. Um, and then over the years, as color printers became more popular, was the idea you could color code the chart. And then it didn't take long before someone said, well, why don't we take the color from the soil behavior type and actually add it underneath the tip resistance? So here is actually the normalized tip resistance. But you can see that it's a very nice way of, of showing the soil type uh, embedded into the penetration resistance. So of course the, the brown is sand and the blue is clay. And so you can see that the, 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 the sand layers are, are colored in brown and the clay is colored in blue. So it's a very visual way of, of seeing the information. But um, in 19, uh, sorry, in 2016, I updated the charts and that was to move to um, descriptions that instead of calling them sand, silt or clay, uh, we should try and use more behavioral descriptions. And so we, could, we should call them either sand-like and clay-like, and then recognize that one of the big behavioral differences is whether or not they're going to be dilative or contractive at large strains. And the reason for wanting to know that is if a soil is contractive at large strains, that means the undrained strength will be less than the drain strength. And so from a design perspective, it's important to know whether or not either a sand or a clay will be contractive at large strains and therefore has the potential to have an undrained strength lower than the drain strength. And then you want to know, is the soil sensitive or insensitive? And more importantly, you want to know whether or not there's any microstructure in the soil. So um, you know, most of the historical research was done on ideal soils that were, they were very young and they had no cementation. So they had little or no microstructure where we know that a lot of natural soils, particularly residual soils, residual soils have residual bonding from the parent rock. And so they, they have microstructure from that bonding. And it would be nice to know whether or not soils have that and how much it will influence the possible interpretation. And so that led to an update of the chart. And this is what it looks like. So it's normalized tip resistance against normalized sleeve friction. The dashed lines are the previous boundaries. And now the solid lines are showing, instead of sort of circular boundaries, they're more hyperbolic in shape. And I've added in this boundary that goes across the middle, which is the con contractive dilative boundary. And so anything that plots above it will tend to be dilative at large strains and anything that plots below it will be contractive at large strains. And of course, in the lower left-hand corner is the clay-like contractive and sensitive soils. Lower right is clay-like contractive. And then upper right is clay-like and dilative and so on. And then it recognizes that there's a zone in the middle that is transitional material. So it's transitioning from being sand-like and predominantly drained penetration during the CPT and transitioning to more clay-like and undrained penetration during the CPT. And in that transitional zone, the material itself could be either sand-like or clay-like, depending on the drainage conditions uh, during the CPT. So if it's more clay-like, uh, it could be a, a, a clay silt where the penetration is undrained, or if it's more sand-like, it could be a silty sand or a sandy silt where the penetration is essentially drained and it'll behave more um, sand-like. Uh, now this, this chart, of course, only applies to soils that have little or no microstructure. 
And so what I suggested in that paper is that uh, I introduced this new chart on the right that brought in the shear wave velocity and said, well, uh, once I've got the shear wave velocity, the small strain shear modulus is the shear wave velocity squared times the mass density. And so G0, so G0 divided by the tip resistance is essentially a stiffness to strength ratio where the shear wave velocity is the measure of the small strain stiffness. The tip resistance is a measure of the large strain strength. So this G over QT is a stiffness to strength ratio. And research showed that generally that varied as a function of how dense the soil was. And but that most young uncemented soils, ideal soils with little or no microstructure would fall within a relatively narrow band. And that if it fell within that band, it was essentially a, an ideal soil. And the traditional soil behavior type chart would work very well. You could expect it to be pretty reliable. But if the soil had some microstructure, so the shear wave velocity would plot outside of this zone, that would indicate that you either had some bonding or aging or some combination of the two or some unusual mineralogy uh, so that there was some unusual behavior and it was plotting outside of the normal region. And therefore the uh, contractive dilative boundary may not be so accurate um, uh, because of that microstructure. And then the chart in the middle is a modification of a chart that Schneider had developed. So Schneider, Randolph and Maine had suggested it. And uh, um, this of course only applies to fine grain soils where you have excess pore pressure. So this is based on the excess pore pressure normalized by the vertical effective stress. And what it shows is if you have an ideal clay, then you have sort of a, a low penetration resistance and some excess pore pressure. But then as the OCR increases, the tip resistance goes up, the pore pressure goes up a little bit, but when the OCR starts to exceed about five or six, then the pore pressure start to go negative and this, this excess pore pressure starts to go uh, to zero or slightly negative. But if the soil has microstructure, such as bonding, then you can actually have soils that look like they should be over consolidated, but the, you're getting very large positive pore pressures consistent with a very contractive behavior. So they appear to be heavily over consolidated. So you'd expect them to be dilatant, but in fact, you're getting very high positive excess pore pressures because what's happening is that the cone is destroying the bonding and, and uh, shearing the soil to large strains. And at large strains, when the bonding is destroyed, the soil is in fact contractive. So these are updates and it illustrates the importance of microstructure. So over the years, there's been a growing uh, use of documented case histories. Uh, here's just an example. So uh, in 2011, 2010 and 2011, there were four major earthquakes in Christchurch in New Zealand. And after those earthquakes, there were a lot of buildings that were damaged and destroyed, and the government uh, needed uh, an investigation to determine uh, which sites uh, were safe to rebuild and which sites the, the houses would have to be destroyed, et cetera. And so they implemented a study and they decided that the CPT was the best way to go. So they implemented a study and they've now completed over 30,000 CPTs in the city of uh, Christchurch. So they now have a database of 30,000 CPTs at sort of essentially one uh, region uh, with, a, with four documented case histories and the performance of every one of these sites under those four different er earthquakes. And of course, uh, recent dam failures, particularly the ones in Brazil, where there was numerous CPTs and lots of regional studies as well uh, that are bringing together thousands of CPTs to create large databases. So when it comes to applications, we're seeing continued and ongoing developments. Of course, continued development for deep foundation design. This was one of the early applications of the CPT. And of course, particularly in the offshore industry, um, the design of deep foundations is still dominated by the CPT. Of course, onshore, still uh, design of shallow foundations. The commonality between these two is moving away from trying to calculate capacity and now focusing more on the load displacement response. And so seismic CPT is becoming value because it measures the small strain stiffness 
which is very valuable in terms of estimating the uh, load displacement characteristics of foundation. And of course, liquefaction that I talked about. There's a, a quality control for ground improvement and environmental applications as well. I haven't had time to talk about environmental, but there are lots of modules that are used for environmental applications. And of course, over the years, because of the digital data, now it's produced a number of software packages that make processing of the data so much easier because it's all digital data. You can read it directly into software. The software is quite sophisticated now. Most of it's in color. Uh, it incorporates a wide range of different interpretation techniques, includes various applications, bearing capacity, settlement, pile design, liquefaction, et cetera. They're all, all embedded in these software packages. Software has become quite sophisticated. Most of it is color presentation. There's various smoothing and averaging of profiles, overlay plots, thin layer corrections, sensitivity analysis, statistical analysis, as I've shown here, where you can look at the uh, frequency distribution of a parameter in a layer or the cumulative uh, probability of that parameter within the layer and so many other features. So lots of development with software and you'll see continued use of that. So in summary, significant progress in the past 50 years. So reliable, robust, sensitive digital cones with added sensors. There's digital data collection and processing, a wide range of pushing equipment where we can push deeper and push into harder soils, difficult access, automation, and continuous pushing. Improved sampling and push-in instrumentation. I didn't talk much about instrumentation, but if you can push in samples, you can push in instrumentation as well. Improved interpretation that's supported by extensive theory and increased uh, use of case history database. So it's now becoming the most popular entry to test in many parts of the world. Let me talk briefly about CPD market and how it influences the future. What you tend to find is that there's a spectrum of projects and the spectrum in simple terms can be from low risk projects, for example, local foundation, uh, property development, and then sort of all the way up to high risk projects such as offshore um, platforms, offshore wind structures, mine tailings, large infrastructures. So these are high risk projects uh, lots of um, dollars involved. The risk of failure is extremely expensive with, with high consequences. So some of these um, tailings dam failures, they've illustrate not only can they cause loss of lice, but the, the cost can be in the billions of dollars. And so obviously the risk is very high. And so for these high risk projects, the focus is often on accuracy and uncertainty. So high risk projects, it's, the design is often risk-informed, where you use risk analysis to um, guide the decision-making process. And so the focus for things like CPT is in accuracy and uncertainty, and often the use of specialty tests, things like seismic CPT, et cetera. And it's done within a risk-based framework. But when you come down to the low-risk projects, like typical local foundation, that's obviously, that's often focused on standardization and efficiency. So for local foundation, often the, the dollar values are very low, so nobody wants to spend much money on site investigation. So the focus is on efficiency. How quickly can you do these tests? How quickly can you collect the data? And if it's going to be done quickly, it needs to be standardized. And often the design is done using various codes. So that's the spectrum uh, of which uh, the CPT marketplace operates in. <laughs> and because of that, what you tend to find is also it's influenced by labor costs. And so uh, when I looked at some of the equipment there, you tend to find that where labor costs are high, then there's a, a move towards automation. So when I showed you those, those automated continuous systems, they're becoming very popular in places like North America and Europe, where labor costs are very high. And so it's cost effective to automate the process and reduce the number of people involved, both for safety and for cost. But in some parts of the world where labor costs are still very low, you tend to see that it's, there's less automation because it's relatively inexpensive to have people there doing the work. So future progress, we're gonna see continued improvement in equipment. You're gonna hopefully see simplified procedures and accuracy, particularly for adding seismic. Um, and then a continued 
trend towards automation, especially in regions of high labor costs. So in North America, South America, parts of uh, Australia, et cetera, uh, and even in Southeast Asia, um, you're beginning to see automation. Continued trend towards continuous pushing uh, with, without these pauses. And that means that seismic uh, may also go continuous as well. It is possible to do to measure shear wave velocity continuously. You don't actually have to stop. Uh, if you have a continuous source, then you can measure shear wave velocity continuous. And then we're likely to see increased growth of combined drilling and CPD, such as sonic. We're going to see increased use of wireline for deeper soundings, and you're going to see CPT move, use more in gravels. So continued advances in equipment and procedure. Uh, future progress, we're going to see more multiple sensors. Um, we're seeing it all the time, new sensors being added. We're going to see advances in combined surface geophysics. In some parts of the world, we're already seeing it where surface geophysics is being partnered with CPT. So particularly in some parts of Europe and in North America, you're seeing surface seismic that will give you a two-dimensional cross-section of the shear wave velocity, as well as the P wave velocity, and doing that prior to doing your CPT so that you can identify the optimum locations to push the CPT. And then advances in push-in samplers, including undisturbed sampling in softer soils, continued growth in case histories, uh, increased use of software in incorporating CPD data. And we're going to see a growth in application of big data. When I talked about Christchurch with 30,000 data, I can see in the future that people, when they have a project, a problem like liquefaction, is what you might do in the future is we have lots of different algorithms where you can estimate uh, the likelihood of liquefaction occurring, and they're all quite well advanced. But I can also see where you could submit your data to a database and say, could you search the database to see if you can find sites that have profiles very similar to the one I have, and then tell me how that site behaved under various earthquakes. And so I see that coming in the future, and that requires a very different mindset of data processing. I'll just make some final comments. Often I read papers where people have come up with new interpretations, and I'm often frustrated because it would be nice if people would take uh, something like the soil behavior type chart. Here I'm just showing my updated one. But use it as a way of saying, well, show your data on this chart so that people can see uh, the range of data that you were basing your correlation on. Because if your data only covered a very small region, then people would be aware that well, the correlation you're suggesting only applies within that region and may not apply outside of that region. And then check for consistency, compare it with previous correlations, because often there are other ones. And again, plot them on the soil behavior type chart as a contours and compare them with previous ones. And um, people often come back to me and say, yes, but that's difficult because your chart is using normalization and uh, my method doesn't use the same normalization, so I can't plotted on the chart. And I say, well, keep in mind that when you're at a depth where the vertical effect of stress is one atmosphere, then this what looks like a complex normalization is literally just the, the tip resistance normalized by atmospheric pressure. So you can put your correlation on here and say, look, at a depth of one atmosphere, I can plot it with confidence and at least see where it plots to get a feel for uh, the range of data and compare it with previous correlations. And I, I show some examples. I won't go into it much here, but historically, for example, friction angle correlations were often based solely on tip resistance. But when you plot it on the chart, it makes you realize that, well, where, where do I stop? Um, does it only apply to clean sands or how far across the chart can I apply this? And of course, a more recent methods based on state parameter, which is more logical way to do it, and it uses the constant volume friction angle. And these are curve relationships, recognizing that the relationship changes with soil type. And so it's useful to plot it in that way. So I know I covered a lot of ground and I, I know I covered it rather quickly, uh, but it has been recorded. So you do have the luxury, you can come back and look at this uh, at a, a later time at your time. So I'm more than happy to take questions. I've given my email uh, contact if you, if you do want to uh, ask a question directly. So feel free to contact me if, if you have any specific questions or if we have any here.
Thank you very much, Dr. Robertson. Uh, due to some time constraints, I think uh, the YouTube transmission must be cut. And so we can continue here for some some minutes. It's because they we they let us know that there is another event. Yes. So I will make sure to get in contact with the people on the on the YouTube uh, broadcast and uh, and and so they can I can I can tell some of the questions to you. Um, the the floor is open to to questions. Uh, I will. I will read some of the questions that have been presented. Yeah, I, the, I can. I, 